If the Blair Witch Project can engage an audience for 81 minutes of people stumbling around the woods, you have no excuse. How do you approach this topic that maybe, you know, 20 other organizations have already touched? Where can you push those boundaries? Don't hide the stuff that makes it cool. Embed that sucker in like the intro. Boring is simply the end result of having a lack of imagination. In certain industries, there are specific things that you cannot be doing. It has to go through. 20 different levels of approval. I don't know any marketer who's like, I love legal. The last thing anyone wants, you know, is to get sued because of a blog post. <laughs> if we're talking about a topic where these guys are the expert, lean into that. Give your personality. If I have to read a line more than once or twice, I'm gone. You need to have fun with content. You need to add some emotion, some passion, a little spice, and your audience will really pick up on that. That's what's gonna resonate at the end of everything. Tell me a little bit about your content marketing philosophy and how it has evolved over time. Oh, that's a good question, Tommy. You know, I've been a longtime listener of the podcast. I think a lot of people in this industry are, so kudos to you for this. But I always like this question because I sometimes, you know, have to sit back and think, how much of how many of us are actually sitting down, taking the time to come up with a content strategy, with a content philosophy? We kind of just do it. So for me, content is often instinctual. You know, I've been, you know, as Tommy said, I've been in so many different industries, so many different roles. I've written and edited about so much content at this point. A lot of my content philosophy is gut reaction, muscle memory. I mean, like any skill, being good at content, being a good writer and an editor takes practice. Lots and lots of practice. Kind of with many conversations about Oxford commas along the way. But Tommy, I don't think that's what you meant. So I also put together just a bunch of different ideas and things that we can talk about today. We're talking about boring content today, mm -hmm. and I'd love to get a little bit of your background, mm -hmm. um, especially talking into the editorial side of things with the with the magazine work. And then how is that? Uh, how is the work there come into the more boring <laughs> uh, content that has been created over time? Yeah. I mean, you know, as Tommy said, I started off in New York City as a magazine editor and, you know, my career is like, I was going to be editor in chief of Glamour. Like I was all about magazine land. And then just with life changes has happened. I ended up moving around different cities, different industries and exploring content and all its glory depths. <laughs> so really looking at how my background in magazines, again, a very visual, a very, you know, audience centric, Tommy, I know how much you love that phrase, um, experience is, and what that means for all the different types of content you can do. So I love this topic and I automatically you know, gravitated towards it when Tommy mentioned, you know, talking about boring content. You know, I've worked in the legal industry before. I've done content for taxes with h &R Block. I've done, you know, in my current role, I'm heading up content for ACASA, which as Tommy mentioned, does um, healthcare revenue cycle management. And who on earth has heard of that? Honestly, I had never heard of that before taking this job. So it was a big learning curve, but it was really interesting. And, you know, reference for all the content people who like me grew really grew up in the nineties. If the Blair Witch Project can engage an audience for 81 minutes of people stumbling around the woods, you have no excuse. You know, boring is simply the end result of having a lack of imagination. You know, I think, as you said in the promo, Tommy, there are no boring topics, only boring approaches and extensions. So, you know, when you are faced with some boring topics, really just rethink it. You know, think of creating content like cooking. I think that's a good example. I love to cook personally. But that said, plain old chicken breast is going to be dry and tasteless no matter what you do. But add some spices, do a marinade, toss in some veggies, and wah! <laughs> then you have it's really about just figuring out what the topic is. What can you do to make it more interesting? All right. So one thing I like to do is find the hook. Now, this is true for any good content strategy, no matter what topic you're doing. Why should your audience care? Especially if you're in an industry that could be considered a little dry, a little bit dense, personally very technical. Get inside the head of your audience. Figure out an angle for the piece. You know, you really need to get as excited as the people who work in this industry. What's the vernacular? What are the right acronyms? What are they reading? What subreddits are they on? What do they care about? Write about that. Add, add kind of that spice. You know, there could be new data that's relevant. There could be trends that you're hearing about. There could be, you know, things some of your colleagues are talking about. You know, don't just focus on knocking out that, you know, typical list of SEO long tail keywords. What do you want your audience to take away from this piece? Why are they coming to you? What, what you know, what's really that intent? 
Um, great example. I just read, you know, in healthcare, there are tons of stats coming out on a daily basis. There's lots of interesting things going on in healthcare. We recently read something saying that 57% of people owe medical debt. That's terrifying, by the way. Can we just talk about how healthcare needs to change? But <laughs> one of the reasons I love working at ACASA is they're using technology to really fix that broken healthcare system. They're looking at how they can use auto advanced automation, all the cool stuff coming at, out of Silicon Valley to fix that medical billing problem. So finding that passion behind it is so important. So going back to that 57% stats, it, it's figuring out, okay, so what does that stat, what does that trend mean for my audience? Why should they care? You know, what does automation mean, mean for that? So really taking a step back and thinking about how can I get a hook in? How can I get that lead in for the piece of content? Now you're a, we've talked about this a little bit, um, about feedback loops, mm -hmm. right? And using those feedback loops, because we talk about intent as a community yeah. a lot. Oh yeah. But what I've also seen just firsthand, and I know I've fallen into this trap myself, we talk about intent, but then really it's just a level, like maybe a meditation, mm -hmm. even if you go that deep on what the intent of the piece might be, it might even not be, um, that might not even be clearly defined, right? From the outset, how are you finding intent and what are you looking at broadly speaking to make sure you can drill that into drill into that in an individual piece? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great question, Tommy. And it's about knowing your audience, you know, when you're in, Again, topics that tend to be more, maybe a little bit drier or industries that are really technical. You need to know your audience. You know, you need to dig into those personas without, you know, without getting too involved in the stereotypes, shall we say. You need to start, you know, talk to people in your field, talk to people who are in your organization, really just getting to know what they want to know. I mean, it's not that different than working in any other industry, I feel like. It's understanding where people are coming from, meeting them where they are, giving them what they want, what they want to know. So for me, it's a lot of that. Yeah. What are you, what are you doing to learn what it is that they want to know? Um, it's a lot of talk, you know, talking to people, talking to our sales team, talking yeah. to our internal people, talking to the people who are out on the front lines. You know, I'm, since I'm in the B2B space, you know, we have a lot of people who are interacting with potential customers, current customers, you know, soliciting feedback, going to events, you know, seeing what the industry is talking about. I mean, my email is like chock full of all like the industry publications. What are the things that they're already reading? What are the, you know, the message boards that they're on? What are the topics they're already engaging? What is the industry as a whole talking about? Being part of that mm -hmm. conversation is just so crucial. Who are the thought leaders? You know, who's talking about, you know, who, what Twitter threads are going on that are just relevant to your space? And when you're having conversations with the internal stakeholders, because yeah. we've talked about internal stakeholders on the show before, mm -hmm. what are those soft skills that you need? Because not every content team, especially within larger organizations, is taken seriously when that conversation's being had. So how are you approaching these different teams uh, overall? What does that look like for you? Well, I am luckily very fortunate in the fact that I've got some great relationships with my current colleagues. Um, you know, they're always open to what content wants to do. They see the importance of it. So getting that backing, you know, from leadership on down is incredible. Do any of your executives have open office hours? I know that's a popular thing. So what are other places that you can go where these conversations are already happening? That's the quickest win. You know, can you push into any team meetings where there are updates going on? Can you, you know, hop on any Slack channels? You know, I'm on a few of those for some of our like in, you know, individual groups. What are things that you can do to already engage in conversations that are happening? That'll be the easiest lift. And then, you know, really what is so crucial is getting those point people on different teams. You know, who are the thought leaders in your company? Who are the good spokespeople? Who are the people who get it? Because some people are, you know, have excellent ideas, but maybe not as good at translating it or need a little help. But again, that's kind of what we do. That's our jobs. <laughs> you know, we're good at, you know, if you're a good writer, editor, hopefully you're good at interviewing. Hopefully you're good at, you know, listening to people and really sussing out what they're trying to say, you know, what they're hearing and, you know, taking good notes. And from a, cause we've talked about operations too. One of the things that we talked about is, um, you know, what would you be interested in? One of the experiences that I've definitely had um, is, okay, yeah, we want you guys to get involved. It'd be fantastic if the content team got involved. Why don't you show up to our meetings 
here's to take a look at our calendars, let your calendar sync up with my calendar and all of this stuff. And what inevitably happens, uh, or at least from what I've seen within multiple organizations now is it's too much work for everybody to actually communicate with each other or see what the upcoming plans are. Have you experienced that one and two, if you have, how have you addressed that? You know, it's about, you know, when you're thinking broadly about, about your content strategy, it's figuring out where you want to interject things. I mean, you know, it's figuring out what the tentpole pieces are, what topics you want to lead in. And then it's figuring out what is possible given the size of your team. You know, are you a team of one? Are you a team of 30? Do you have tons of people? Can you, you know, put resources in different places? So I think it's to answer your question, I think it's about right sizing and knowing that what is it? Perfection is the enemy enemy of good. I think that's the good quote. So really thinking mm-hmm. about what you can get done, and you know, maybe you're not in every meeting, and that's okay. Maybe your calendar isn't lining up 100% of the time. Be you know, be nice to yourselves. <laughs> it's figuring out what are your right. ultimate goals and how can the things that your colleagues are working on fit into that and fit into your larger content strategy. Um, it's about being a good team player. You know, I often look at content and the content team as a service organization for the rest of the org. You know, what are things that Mm -hmm. we can do to help everyone else help, you know, drive some of their metrics so that we all, you know, play nice with others that we can all accomplish the same thing. At the end of the day, we all want our brands, our products, our businesses to succeed. How can we do that? Content is a great way to get storytelling that a lot of our Mm -hmm. colleagues may not have those, you know, those opportunities. So I find people are so excited when we want to talk to them, when we want to interview them. You know, we just did an interview um, with one of our revenue cycle people the other day, and she was so passionate about this topic. And that's what I love. That's why I get up every day you know, to do what I do. It's for that passion and to help translate that and tell the stories out there. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, I've seen done brilliantly, and this was from another team that had come in when I was at one of the organizations I was in house at, um, when they had introduced themselves, they did a roadshow of like, this is what our team is. This is what we're about. Here's how we approach stuff. These are the different elements of what we're doing. And they did this really excellent job of setting the context. And I think what I've found is that the context setting for within organizations, like the content team really likes to live in isolation in some ways because they're going, hey, we're this creative team. And then a lot of the information uh, doesn't get exchanged in a way that's actually useful. So I like what you're saying here about really taking the time to get other people excited just by having their voice involved and and letting them know that we're not creating an isolation. I've said this before in pretty much every organization I've worked with. If I'm doing my job right, I know what everyone else is doing. I know what their pain points are. I know what they're talking about. It's, you do have to do a lot of listening. Yep. And sometimes it's active listening, being a part of the conversation. Sometimes it's what is it, sitting back, shutting up and listening and looking at ways that you can really start to take in content, start to be aware of what's happening and then start to figure out how that works for a content strategy. That was one of the things that Margaret Jones from Airtable had talked about uh, a while ago where she said, we've got an intake process, but we try to also keep our thumb on the pulse mm-hmm. of what's going on. So it's usually not a surprise when people are asking for certain things. Now, I want to take that to transition into the next part of the conversation, which is how are you taking those conversations and including those in the planning process? It's really figuring out, it could be anything. It could be a snippet. It could be, you know, you're having a conversation with someone and a sentence sparks an idea for a blog post. It could be something like, oh, I've been seeing this trend or, oh, I just got off a call with a customer and they're really seeing this pain point. You know, for example, you know, one thing we kept hearing about in some of our um, internal conversations was about, you know, how people are struggling with what to do after they implement automation. So a lot of what we talk about. So what we started doing is putting together a whole strategy and whole content, you know, package around life after automation. And our, you know, we're working on it right now. And our team is so excited to be able to have those types of assets you know, their blog posts, we, we're probably going to put them together into like a nice larger asset, create some things for our different team to use. So providing content that's useful, that's interesting, and that looks at things and solves real questions is what we're, what we're really all about. I'd be interested to know um, 
more about when it gets to down to a granular level, right? How does that start to look when you're actually getting that feedback and saying, we've got this piece that we want to do, and then how are we going to do it? And then I want to zoom back out after that and talk about the more of the calendaring process and everything. Sure. I mean, it's really figuring out like broad, broad question. What is your content strategy? What is the type of content you're doing? Are we talking blog posts, videos? I mean, it could be as simple as a graphic that's you know, showing up an interesting quote. So I think it's about what works for your brand. How do you want to give people information and staying true to that? And then figuring out where are different topics and also knowing, I think just as importantly, when to say no or when to say not now. Because knowing, I think, when is the right time to do a piece of content is almost more important than just popping things out on a, on a you know, certain cadence. Quality over quantity, I think, is really important in the content space. So knowing what makes the most sense and what should your priorities be. And being aware that you know, when you're in different brands, when you're in different businesses, priorities change. And something you thought you'd be doing you know, when you put your prioritization together at the beginning of the quarter might look very differently a few months down the line. It's the idea of being flexible, going backwards a little bit. And this was something that kind of stood out to me too. There's a balance between flexibility in the planning process versus um, being able to use your talents appropriately. One of the things that I've said to people is, I'm a chef, not a short order cook. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that balance? Because um, I know that it can lean often in one direction versus the other. How are you letting people know that there is craft involved to what you're doing and that not everything can be last minute or highest priority. No. And I think that's hard because, you know, especially as you're engaging with so many different colleagues from different teams all around the, all around the co company, it's figuring you know, it's, it's trusting your own expertise and knowing that you're the expert and having the confidence to say, I really like that idea. You know, let's look at that in the next quarter. Or like, oh, you know what? I'm already working on a piece about this. Maybe I can infuse some of that language in. So it's a matter of taking a step back and saying, you know, is this right for the audience, for the business? Someone may have an amazing idea. They frequently come at the executive level. <laughs> and it's really figuring out like, all right, you know, putting it through your own gut. Like, does this make sense? Or what, you know, what is the purpose? How does this already align with what I'm saying, with what we're trying to accomplish? And sometimes it is. And looking at just level of effort, sometimes these are like just quick wins. Sometimes these are things that can really help inform your strategy that can, would be of interest. Your editorial background has really encouraged you to make these things visual, right? One of the things that's really great about Acosta, the Acosta blog is that it's a lot of visual and this visual element to it is what makes it interesting, what makes what could be boring content very interesting. Getting graphics, getting design support, this can be very, very difficult to do. Can you tell me about how you're getting that type of support? Sure. I mean, again, it's being a good colleague. You know, whenever I join an organization, you know, one of the first people I always befriend is our creative director. Hey, Janae. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's getting buy-in for content is across the board is just, it's crucial. You know, you, t you know, I think this goes, harkens back to my magazine days, but you know, you tell a story very visually, you know, be, you know, while you're coming up with the idea, you should also be thinking about how am I going to tell this visually? What images am I going to use? Are there examples? Are there screenshots? Are there product shots? Are there graphics? You know, at Acasa, we just underwent a giant um, re uh, redesign of the whole website, which was a very fun process. Um, but it was really done with a uh, graphic treatment in mind. What are things that we can add that we can infuse into our blog and throughout the site that would make it easier to ingest, easier to understand, easier to read through, you know, what are block quotes you can use? What are individual graphics? You know, when you, when you talk about getting buy-in, you know, with, and getting graphics, I know every team is faced with different challenges. We, we all are. There's, you know, as much as we would like it, there is not a limitless, you know, amount of, effort and operations and budget, unfortunately. So it's about being creative. It's figuring out which pieces are the ones you want to go big with. What are some things that can be a little softer? What are, you know, what are graphic elements that you can really reuse that you can use in different places? What are, you know, kind of your tentpole stats that you turn to that are relevant to a lot of different places? What are things that, you know, maybe you work with a designer to create a Canva template. And then those are things that you can pop in and use in different places. So there's a lot of really creative ways, but I think it's, being open and honest about what are the needs of content, 
and taking it from good to great and graphics and visual treatments, the hierarchy of content, you know, what are ways that you can break things up? Those are all things that really have to go in, you know, as you're putting together your strategies, as you're outlining, as you're coming up with an idea for a piece, it's also thinking about the graphics ahead of time so that you give yourself enough time to really execute properly in both the words and the visuals. I think one of the things too, because I, I know that there's definitely been one of the challenges that I've had is getting that overall support. Mm -hmm. But what I found is that when I work with my design teams to at least set a set of standards, mm -hmm. right. Um, and give sign off on, yes, we'll, we'll allow this to happen is making sure it's part of my budget and my planning right. process 100%. to get that in there and then also making sure of the operations that the designer gets what they need mm -hmm. at a certain point in time so you can launch with really high quality stuff trust is the mm -hmm. biggest part where designers in particular will trust that you're upholding the standards i mean every design team that i've worked with organizes things differently likes to work with different ways but if you partner with them if you talk about all right here's what i'm trying to accomplish they are pretty much, you know, universally all so receptive to that because they like doing good work too. So it's really crucial uh, partnership. Designers and writers have to be BFFs <laughs> to get all of this stuff. And, you know, I, you know, if you're working on, you know, a larger effort, like an ebook or something that's a little bit more visually, bring them in like right when you're concepting, what are things that we can do? Because sometimes then you can write to those visuals. Oh, you know what? You're doing this checklist. This could make for a really interesting infographic. Let's start thinking about what that might look like. What are other elements that you may want to include? Think of it all as a package. So right when you're starting writing, you also need to be thinking visuals. It's crucial. What would be some additional advice you could give to help build that relationship? You know, one of the things that I really think takes, again, content from good to great is humanizing it. So the more you can talk to people, the more you can incorporate first person pieces, the more you can get in those anecdotes. That's what makes your content really special. You know, that's how you, you know, that's how you show passion for a topic. You need to give your audience really a reason to care, a reason to engage. That's what makes for good content. Again, that's what gets me up every morning. So the more you can speak to people, the more you can add in that additional voice. And that's the only way you're going to get that is to talk, is speaking with other people, having good relationships, stalking people on Slack, you know, finding out uh, what the really great information is out there. You know, case in point, you know, at Acasa, we also do, you know, we do a lot with engineering. You know, we're an AI machine learning company and machine learning content can get a bit dry at times, especially when you don't have a background in it. There's a lot of Python. There's a lot of code. Um, but it's, a, but at the end of the day, so, you know, the engineers that I've met and have the benefit of working with are so incredibly passionate. They are in it, you know, not just to write lines of code, they're in it to change the world. They want to improve healthcare for everyone. And that's the kind of passion that you really need to have good connections with, that you need to engage people with. Um, you know, great example is uh, one of the engineers that we were working with. I you know, followed him on LinkedIn because that's also a good thing. I connect with everyone that I can at the company on LinkedIn because you never know who's posting what on there, on Twitter, on you know, whatever the different platforms are because um, you never know what you're going to find out. You know, there was one engineer who posted something about why he joined Acasa. Like, you, can, you can't make this kind of stuff. So we had, you know, it was a nice, quick little post. We reached out to him and had him do a full long blog post for us. So it's about like, what are those little moments that are already out there that you can pick, that you can find, and that you can help, you know, add to your strategy and do, you know, blow up a little bit. I'm going to ask one more question mm -hmm. before we move on to the pregame part of the conversation. This is going to be the big one, uh -oh. right? Some organizations, uh, especially the larger, less scrappy, uh, old guard companies, are hesitant mm -hmm. to bring perspective mm -hmm. to the content that you're producing, right? You and I both have worked in tax, you know, areas, uh -huh. right? Nothing that's particularly interesting. The subject matter itself <laughs> can be very dry. Um, how are you having those conversations upward mm -hmm. to get some fearlessness involved or really have that conversation of get permission, if you will, yeah. to take a perspective, to have an angle, to um, 
make interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. No, it's really hard. Like I said, you know, we've both worked in the tax space. I'm in healthcare right now. I was in higher ed. Like these are all things, places that are known for being very red tape heavy. Um, but it really just depends on your organization. You know, I've worked at larger ones that are so receptive to things like that, small and smaller ones that are just very careful about every single word they say. And it has, you know, we've all been in places where it has to go through 20 different levels of approval for a single blog post. Like, so some of it is knowing your organization and figuring out what the attitude is. You have to have buy-in from your boss, your boss's boss, whatever that level is. And that's where I think sometimes getting agreement for an overarching content strategy is here's what we're trying to do. I think a lot of it though, Tommy, is also show, don't tell sometimes. Just try it. Start infusing some things and see what that element of comfort is about. You know, you want to be careful because in certain industries there are specific things that you can't, you should not or cannot be doing. So you need to be aware of that. You know, the last thing anyone wants, you know, is to get sued because of a blog post. <laughs> so, so I think what is the flexibility in the space that you're in? What is keeping things correct? What is, but also interesting, where can you push those boundaries? Where are things that you can talk about to make them a little bit more interesting you know working in taxes nothing gets more complicated and complex with that but you know what i feel like you know this topic you know there's no such thing as you know boring content you know i think you had said you know, it's just uh boring approaches there's a lot there's a lot to be said for that it's not so much about you know being boring content but what is your level of creativity with it and that's really how you think about how can creative can you be how can you approach this topic that maybe you know 20 other organizations have already touched what is your unique perspective on it? And then how can you bring that to bear without you know, scaring your legal team? So I think that, a to I know, just thinking, because a topic I was writing about, uh, editing about this morning uh, was a piece about, you know, how you can increase engagement for your team. Yeah. You know, general topic can probably appear on any industry, but how do you make it interesting? How do you make it unique? All right. So we, we plop, did it from a first person perspective. You know, my, John Shieldsmith, who's an amazing writer on my team. Thank you, John. Um, you know, interviewed one of our SMEs, um, someone who's a great expert in this area and got a fantastic first person story that added like was like heart wrenching, like really emotional. It's looking for those pieces that add emotion, that add the passion, that show why we're doing what we do or why this is important. I think it all, for me, content always just goes back to passion, having that energy, showing that interest, showing why we're doing something. That's the stuff that makes content really sing. And it goes back to what we were talking about before about building the relationships overall and finding the trust because, you know, legal teams in particular, <laughs> I don't know any marketer who's like, ah, I love legal, mm -hmm. but building those relationships and building that trust and knowing that they know that you know mm -hmm. what they are looking for becomes so important to the overall uh, thing. So they can, again, it's like designers, let them get their hand off the wheel a little bit and know that everybody's doing stuff in the best interest of the company, but also for the customer. Well, it's also, with content, it's also about building that trust ahead of time. You know, as if you have, if you've already cemented a good relationship with someone before an issue comes to play, then you already have that foundation built and you can both come at it at a much more, you know, much more concrete way. So you can all understand what each is trying to accomplish. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's talk about pregame, right? You get everything you need. You've had the conversations. You've got the sign offs as part of the process. What's your pregame? You're taking a look at the piece. You've gotten everything that you need. So I think one of the experts on your show said, what is it? They sit on their hands. You know, I have a similar yeah. mentality. It is so easy as an editor to all of a sudden just jump into line editing. It's easy. It's our comfort zone. But that's where you can really take your editing from good to great. It's, you know, the first thing I try to do when I look at a piece is figure out what type of editing does it need? Because you know, there are so many different types. Sometimes, it, you know, what you really need to start with when you're first editing a piece is taking a step back and figuring out is the structure right? Does this make sense? So giving it a quick read, giving it a skim, just thinking about, all right, is this piece accomplishing what it needs to? You know, you could have had the best brief and it all looked good in you know, the outline and then you get down into it and you have to do a gut check. And that's where good editing comes into play. That's where, you know, the, where you've honed your craft and you know what to look for. It's figuring out, okay, is this still the right? 
is this still trying to, you know, hit just, is this going to hit that intent that we talked about earlier? So for me, that's always where I start. So looking at, is the structure correct? Does this make sense? Is this the right piece? Is, you know, does this paragraph need to be moved here? Do, you know, do we need to take this piece? And is it one piece or is it two? You know, we, um, back last fall, you know, a lot of what we were hearing in the healthcare ref cycle space was talking about staffing challenges. Okay. So, you know, we put together a great blog post about, you know, what are some of the common staffing challenges? But as I kept reading it, there was so much more to tell in that story. So that one blog post, all of a sudden was like, all right, let's add a little bit more and then a little bit more. And all of a sudden it's a damn ebook <laughs> that ended up being, that ended up being a springboard for a giant multi multi-channel campaign. So, but that's a story for another time, but it's knowing that, like, are you tell like when you first look at it, are you telling the story in the right way? Yeah. Another thing that I look for when I'm, when I go more into the line editing piece, my philosophy is don't use 10 words when five will do. <laughs> I'm really about being succinct. And I like to thank my first foray into content for that. I was, I, when I was in college, I did an internship all throughout school at time magazine for kids. It was so much fun. I had a great experience there. Still talk to a lot of the people I work with. But while I was there, I was writing articles, so again, for a children audience, but the stories were like 15 words long. Try cramming in really kind of often complex topics, boiling it down to that audience, but into 15 words. I often laugh that that could not have been a better experience for getting into content. Learning how to take your story, get it down into the simplest possible format, what really matters, I think that has really set me up throughout my entire career. You want to talk about UX writing? Oof. Try writing your stories in 15 words. So that's one thing <laughs> I, I sometimes like to test myself. If I'm writing a piece, if I'm editing, like, you know, can you put a story into 15 words? And once you do, you essentially have your meta <laughs> description also. So I think about like, that's just a nice you know, content game that I like to play with myself sometimes. Nice. And you're doing this from like a technical, like purposeful exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. We're writers, we're editors, we're editorial people. We need to hone our craft. You know, we all graduated from college <clears throat> years ago. Um, or, you know, we've all, you know, we've been in this business for quite a while, particularly if you're at the upper levels. Like sometimes it's still fun to play with words, to play with content, to stretch yourself, to see like, all right, what am I trying to do? Now we're all extremely busy. We don't have time for this all the time, but there are little like mind games that you like to, that you need to play sometimes just to keep it fresh. Yeah. One of the things I do with my team, and then we're going to move into the edit itself. But one of the thing I try to do with the teams that I've run is I'll send out an image of just some random person looking like they're doing some random job, right? Or random group of people. And then say to the team of people, tell me what they're doing, right? It doesn't even necessarily have to be related to the, um, to the business that we're working on. Just what's their background? How did they get into this thing? Uh, who are the other people in the picture? Like, what is the overall story that this person is a part of? And, you know, it's, it's a different type of exercise than what you're talking about, but it's one of those things where it gets you engaged in a different way and tries to break that pattern of, okay, we're creating another blog post. <laughs> it's got to have a bunch of graphs right. and it's got a bunch of images. Like it's this understanding of who are we creating for, which becomes vital, like absolutely mm -hmm. vital to the boring content. Mm -hmm. Let's move into the edit itself. Mm -hmm. What was your first impression of this piece? Mm -hmm. Well, first I went, oh hell, <laughs> content audits, content refreshes. We just did one. So I was like, not more of this. <laughs> John, I mentioned is somewhere screaming as well because we've been doing this for so long. So some of it was like, if you're in this space, it, that's, you start to get ugh, the chills when anyone talks refreshes an audit. It, you know, content audits are a necessary evil in this business. You want to keep everything good. You want to make sure your stuff is actually performing. Um, so first of all, I think the topic is excellent. You know, one of the things I want to give this writer kudos, it's a really good piece. So, you know, it was kind of hard from an editing perspective, really starting to pick and choose. And that's one of the things you really want to think about when you're looking at a piece is figuring out like, where is this? What changes do I need to make? Sometimes it's fine as is. But sometimes there are other things you can do if you have the right resources, if you have the information, if you have the bandwidth sometimes. Sometimes a good piece of content is fine. But when possible, you always want to try to stretch yourself. What are ways that you can do to make it even better? So you'll find that's what a lot of the suggestions that I have that I put into the piece. Awesome. All right. So this is 
a boring topic for anybody <laughs> who is in this space. It's boring, but very, very necessary. <laughs> I think yes. We've been, you know, we've been through, and that's a lot of the things that, you know, when we talk about boring content that people face, like it's boring, but these are the things that actually from the day to day are really important to the, to an audience. If someone is, you know, seeing lackluster results in their blog, they probably need a content refresh. They need to do an audit. So this is going to be crucial to them. So it's with sometimes with boring content, it's even more important that you get it right. Cause these can be fundamentals for someone's business, for their brand. Do you feel that this piece had injected that personality? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the just overall comments I had. I think the, Bones were all really there. The information was correct. You can tell that they've done this. I don't think it had maybe the personality, the expertise. So look at, let's look through some of the contents here. Um, one did comment I did have that made it a little challenging for editing. It looked like the uh, formatting had been cleared a little bit. There weren't bullet points or anything like that. So sometimes it was hard to tell the structure of the piece. Um, so that was one, one fun challenge. So you always want to make it easier for your editor. Um, I really liked, you know, starting off how it maximizes the return on investment, really talking about why this is important, why you want to continue reading. I think that's a great way to kick off. Um, let's see, what else, what else do I put in here? I put it, you know, what are ways that you can also show it's not just about the money? What are things that you can do to show why it's important for your audience as well? So I think there's just some things that you can interject there. Um, so one, I'm trying to, trying to find the edit that I have, but it was... Where was it? All right. So one of the overall pieces of feedback that I had about this piece was, you know, there's a thing somewhere in the, yeah, there we go. So this line, whether you're considering content refreshes to help you grow, amplifying your content strategy, help you save by focusing on fewer, higher impact pieces of content. So that's one piece of, you know, line editing feedback, you know, don't use 10 words when five will do. Some of those sentences, some of the sentence structure got a little clunky. You know, my rule of thumb is if I have to read a line more than, you know, once or twice, I'm gone. So you want to make it really easy for your um, readers to digest things, to understand what you mean. Sometimes, you know, as writers, we have so many great ideas. Pick one. <laughs> it really nuts it down. What are you trying to say? What is the most important? Um, so one suggestion, thinking with broad strokes, what I had for this piece um, is, you know, Verbilio. So it looks like it's a content marketing agency, you know, saying Verbilio can help all along the spectrum. And that's great. I'm okay with product placements when they make sense. But if we're talking about a topic where the, these guys are the experts in the piece, lean into that. Give your personality. Talk about like we've done 5 billion different content refreshes. Here's what we've learned. Those are easy ways that you can really start to lean into, you know, your own expertise in an area. That's where you can take content from, you know, just basic to really showcasing why you're the experts in this place. What can we show to, you know, we've done, if we've done so many of these, how can we make it more interesting? How can we, you know, go along the tact of like, learn from us. So that's a lot of what, if I, what I try to do with content. You know, you have to build trust with your audience. You know, when you're doing really good content, your audience should trust you. Trust that every word you say is correct or trust that you are, you know, giving them good advice, giving them good strategies because you've been there, done that. Another broad stroke thing is, you know, if we're talking refreshes, something that, you know, if they have some great experience in this space, one way that they can take it again, good to great is really focusing on maybe before and afters. If they're, they have so much experience refreshing pieces, show what it looked like before and how they changed it and what, you know, what some of those metrics were, were, did it work? I think that kind of first person, like that type of experience will really make this piece a little bit more engaging. So they talk a lot about what to do, but show it, show, don't tell. I think is always a really great example for things like this, particularly when you're in some of these more methodical, like how to pieces. I think this is an excellent opportunity for the company to, to really showcase mm -hmm. that yep. personality, right? Like there's, there's with a topic like this, which is beat to death in the content marketing yeah. space. Everyone, right? everyone and has this article and probably has seven, you know, a whole exactly. series of it. Exactly. And it's one of those things where we can really look at and have the freedom to, I think this is the big thing is have the freedom to, and allow yourself to in, uh, have a little bit more personality because without that, 
it's going to look mm -hmm. and read like every single other piece that's on the same subject. But if you can say like, you know, here are specific examples of refreshes that we've done, maybe even on your own blog, if you can't share client examples, but what are things that you can do to showcase how this works like live, live in the field? Oh, also, all right. One thing that irked me a little bit, if you go down to the bottom of the page where you see bonus, see a refresh in action. They've got a video of, so, of uh, someone from their marketing team doing a refresh. Get that up. Don't hide the stuff that makes it makes it cool. Embed that sucker in like the intro. Give you know give your audience the ability to walk through different things, to experience it in whatever media they you know whatever uh, type of content they want. This is great. I was part of a company um, right before I left Shopify. I was part of another part of the organization and part of the strategy that they had was to embed their YouTube videos. Like they would take the content, mm -hmm. they get it ranked, they'd validate whichever ones were getting the most traffic. And then we'd make uh, scripts out of those particular videos. And then those videos were then embedded at the top of these pages mm -hmm. that were already ranking. And what that did was it, it had automatic, um, rankability or watchability in YouTube, which then boosted up the rankings in YouTube. So now the company's in multiple places and they really only had to do the work one and a half times. 100%. So, you know, one way I like to make, you know, again, boring content a little more interesting is you don't get more boring than, you know, when you have your talking heads at a company doing, uh, doing conferences, doing shows. Okay. So yep. one thing I always try to do, you know, cause there's often some very valuable takeaways. We will, you know, get it recorded or hopefully get a live stream of it, get that video, put together a list of like takeaways from the post, but then embed it right in the top so that, yes, yeah, someone mm -hmm. can skim through the takeaways. They can watch the video. It's about, you know, the, you know, whenever you can make content multimedia, it's usually an improvement. Well, and it's a really great way to, even if the, even if you have to approach this piece formulaic by the numbers, like do the thing that, you know, we gotta, we gotta. X, Y, Z things, because that's how we feel like we have to approach it yep. because it's very technical. It's very dry or whatever. By bringing in the multimedia, you automatically have that level of personality yep. because you have a personality like giving, like presenting the information. Um, companies that really do a great job of this, I think are Moz. Yep. Uh, Wistia does an am amazing job with this. And there are a bunch of others, okay. Riverside, the platform that we're using right now, right? They have this, here's how to use the product, but it's also like really interesting, the people that are there. Yeah. So if we want to make boring content interesting, that's Again, another way to do it. You know, if you want to make boring content interesting, you have to humanize it. You have to bring people into it. You have to show different perspectives. You have to show that that passion. You have to show those first person examples. Those are the things that are really going to un unboring your content. All right, let's scroll back up here. I want to walk through some of these uh, edits that you have here. Uh, so we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but why should you do a content refresh word chaos? <laughs> so that was some of it like, you know, that goes back to figuring out what are you trying to say? Word chaos is my like, if there's just too much going on, it's a little bit of a, you know, a tornado going on. So really trying to figure out what are your, you know, what are your thoughts? making sure your sentence structure is clear. What are you really trying to accomplish with a phrase, with a sentence? And sometimes it's okay to have a sentence that's a few words long. It's okay to have a paragraph that's like a few words long. You know, your mm -hmm. high school English teacher might disagree, but you know, we're breaking the rules now. It's really, you know, going back to that, you know, how to visualize content as your eye goes on the screen, as you're looking, you know, reading an article on mobile, like you need to be able to digest it in a way that makes sense. So, you know, again, another piece of feedback for this next section um, is there's a lot of content. Those are some chunky paragraphs. You switch that to mobile, all of a sudden that's taking up the, like, the majority of your screen. So I think, you know, I think I called out here, like this section is like screaming for H3s or bullets or something. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, for example, the sentence starting, you know, one reason to simply update or improve outdated information. You could also do that yeah. where that, you know, update or improve outdated information is now your H3. There's a lot of things that you can do with that there. Um, so I think looking for ways to cut it down. Don't use 10 words when five will do. Uh, There's something that's interesting about this part right here uh, too. Like also the product placement is here is off. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a, a way to integrate product into these pieces. Tell me a little bit more about what you thought about this element in particular. Again, when you're writing particularly B2B, product placement is sometimes a fact of life and you know, you can do it in the right way. But I think that's where my feedback before was talking about not just Rebilio can help. That tells me nothing. How are they going to help me? But if you're saying like at Rebilio, we have done, you know, X number of content refreshes and we're going to teach you about what we've learned. I think that's a much stronger message and it feels less salesy. You know, if I hmm. am reading an intro and all of a sudden it sounds like the rest of the blog is just going to be you selling, trying to sell me something, I'm out. But if you're saying like, oh, for, at Rebilio, we have this expertise, learn from us. I'm like, all right, I'm more intrigued. And then if you know, then if you want to get more into the salesy stuff, you can stick that down, stick that down the bottom. You know, you want to keep people on your site. You want to you know, keep your bounce rate good. <laughs> you want to show right. them, you know, you want to show them that you're an expert in the piece. And then once they trust you, then you can start slipping in some more product level, some more bottom of the funnel messaging, because that's what's then going to make them trust you and say like, all right, I read through all this. This was really good content. These were really good tips. I feel better for reading this. Oh, they offer products. Let me take a look. Because now you have to build that trust with content before you can ever expect someone to want to engage with your product. I want to take that just a step further too, because I've seen this, um, something that I've done is work with our tutorials team, for example, especially if we're in a software. And what works or what I've found is very useful is if we're able to embed product tutorials mm -hmm. within this piece, not in a way that interrupts the flow of everything, but if it's a really prime example of, you know, we can help, then we've got to, here's how. Mm -hmm. And from a buyer's perspective, and I know that there's a ton of research out here too, people will watch tutorials so they can virtually test drive the product, mm -hmm. right? So this gives an opportunity to put that in context. Yeah, I mean, the more you can do tutorials, the more you can do demos. Again, when it makes sense, it's, I think that goes back to our earlier conversation about intent. Is that what they're trying to get out of the piece? Is it useful? And if it's not, don't put it in because your just your strategy is just going to suffer. Yeah, and it gives you an opportunity to build relationships with those other teams mm -hmm. as well. Exactly. Right? So you're sharing your calendar with with the with the tutorial team, and you're like, "Hey, here's the things that we're thinking about," and they're like, "Hey, we have excellent you know things that could be integrated in that." Well, one of the things I'm doing right now is we work very closely with our product marketing team. Every content team out there does it. So, you know, in order to help tell the story better about some of the things that we're doing, I put together just kind of a, a strategy about how we can do some content around kind of product led messaging. So different categories, here are different products, here are the pieces within that product. You know, here are the different types of things that we're going to be offering. Let's do a whole package of content that's going to get at something like prior auth or like some of our very individual pieces. So what are ways that we can do to kind of tackle that area holistically, what are ways that we can make it interesting, make it engaging, cross-link the hell out of it, have a pillar piece. So just ways that we can look at content and answer all everyone's questions from first person perspectives, SEO driven, thought leadership, you know, all the different things. And again, that's another way to tackle kind of quote unquote boring content. Right. Um, okay. Well, we're going to, I would like to take the next couple of minutes mm -hmm. here to sort of summarize everything that we've been talking about so far and uh and then we'll wrap the show i feel like we've talked about a lot <laughs> i think you know i think the overarching idea is there's no such thing as boring content i think we can all agree about that honestly it's about not being a boring content team <laughs> it's about having fun with it it's showing new approaches it's being aware of what your audience needs meeting them there it's humanizing your content it's just making it fun you need to have fun with content. You need to add some emotion, some passion, a little spice, you know, and your audience will really pick up on that. That's what's going to resonate at the end of every day. Find me online. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can Tiffany, um, Tiffany Smith. You can find me on Twitter. Tiffany is right. W R I T E. You know, feel free, you know, Watchers of the show, feel free to DM me if you have any questions. Always happy to check content. That's one of the reasons I love this podcast. Fantastic. And we're going to be adding uh, you to a special Twitter list that is only guest of the show. So you can follow along on there. And uh, I'll send a link out to that in the replay that we put out. Excellent.
Uh, speaking of replay, we'll be putting the replay out to this on Friday on YouTube. So if you are subscribed to the Content Studios email list, you should be able to get access to that. If you want to subscribe to the Content Studios email list, it's the contentstudio.com forward slash the cutting room uh, with hyphens in between each word. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Have a great rest of the day.